like to tell you something about Angular, or Angular 2 uh, in this case. Uh, my name is Bernhard Niedermeyer. I'm working uh, in Lint as a full stack uh, developer uh, at Catalyst. We've been playing around uh, with Angular 2 uh, for some time, and you might wonder why. Uh, Angular 2 is not even yet, let's say, finished. There is no uh, stable release. It's still in beta phase. Uh, and also, uh, this is the mobile track. You as a mobile developer, why should you care about uh, JavaScript like web front end uh, framework? Uh, to answer this uh, beforehand, why should you care about Angular 2 at, at this point? We st well, I th started to think about it when we were still uh, developing Angular 1, uh, or when we were offering Angular 1 uh, software to our customers, and we got the question, are we buying a product that's going to be dead in one year or two years? And is an Angular 1 application still maintainable uh, when Angular 2 is around in, in, let's say, one or two years? So this was the time when we started to think more about Angular 2, especially where there was always this like maintenance uh, that, that Angular 1 and Angular 2 will not be uh, compatible, that Angular 2 will not be backwards uh, compatible. Um, there has been uh, um, a module and plugin like uh, ng-migrate to, to help you with this, so there's no need now to worry about maintainability of, of Angular 1 applications now where there is version 2. Nevertheless, uh, we want to be like uh, at, the, at the latest development from of, of the, the technology. And this is when we start said, OK, now we start developing uh, Angular 2 uh, applications, even though it's still in, in beta phase. Why should you as a mobile developer care about uh, Angular 2? You probably know there's a big player behind uh, Angular. It's Google. And as it's always the case, a, a big player attracts many other uh, players on the market. So there are many, many side projects around uh, Angular uh, Angular 2 uh, for full stack uh, JavaScript development so that you have Angular also on the back end, not only on the front end. And on the other hand, uh, for the mobile uh, uh, field. So there are, and I will present one today, there are several projects uh, around the idea of, uh, idea of uh, running uh, Angular applications on your mobile devices. Uh, first thing you might, uh, uh, might have come to your attention uh, when you've already looked uh, at some Angular 2 code. Uh, it claims to be a JavaScript uh, framework, but uh, the code looks quite uh, weird for JavaScript. Uh, and this is because it's not uh, the JavaScript as we know today, ECMAScript 5, but it's uh, written in TypeScript. Uh, to give you a short background uh, about this one, so now we have ECMAScript 5 uh, running on, uh, interpreted on, on all our, uh, our browsers. Um, there's ECMAScript 6 coming, or ECMAScript uh, 2015. It adds uh, some things to, uh, to ECMAScript 5, uh, such as classes, block scoped variable, uh, arrow functions, and, and so on. Um, and another superset of this is, is TypeScript, uh, which, for example, um, adds uh, annotations uh, to, to JavaScript. Uh, and this is something uh, that is heavily used uh, by Angular 2. Uh, what would you do with a TypeScript application if your browser can't uh, interpret it or if your browser can't run it? Uh, this is something, uh, uh, some, some question that's, that's not new uh, in, in front-end development. Uh, we've already had this uh, uh, in, in the domain of styling. Uh, when we started to not write uh, pure uh, CSS anymore, but uh, when we started to write uh, less uh, or SAS, for example, and then uh, we had uh, CSS uh, stylings uh, generated out of, of those less files. Uh, and a similar thing um, can now be done uh, with TypeScript. So we can uh, take our TypeScript code and transpile it uh, to, to ECMAScript 5 or JavaScript code, which can run then on, on any browser. Um, there is uh, 
uh, a small uh, node uh, package called uh, Angular CLI, uh, where with just uh, two or three uh, commands, uh, you can set up a new project, uh, set up the transpiling and, and run it in, on your browser. I will show this later to you. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, there's nothing to worry about. There's TypeScript now and it can't run in our browser yet, uh, but there are ways uh, to cope with this. So let's come to um, the most basic principle of, of Angular 2, um, it's components. Um, each Angular uh, application uh, is organized uh, in, into components. Uh, such as we've uh, shown here, we have one main component uh, for the entire app. We have a small component on the, on the top left and we have this uh, wizard component with the, uh, the navigation on the top and the, the buttons on, on the, the bottom and the, the actual content. Uh, so what the component is, it's, it's a block uh, where we encapsulate on, on the one hand uh, the actual UI, so the, in this case the, the HTML, HTML code uh, which is shown in the browser, uh, but also the, the logic uh, or some of the logic behind it. So the, the typical controller uh, is, is encapsulated with the, uh, with the view into one um, component. What does this look like? Um, this is an example of, a, of our Hello World um, component. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, here you, we have the, the annotation, we have the add component uh, to indicate uh, that uh, we're writing a component and to uh, have a wrapper for the, all the, the metadata we're giving it. We're having a, a selector uh, which you can think of as your custom HTML tag, so we define a HTML tag hello world. Uh, and we're giving it a template, so this is the, the actual uh, UI part, uh, where we say, uh, if there's a name defined, we print hello and then the name, and if there's no name uh, defined, we just uh, print hello world. And uh, this is basically the, the definition of the, the, the metadata for our component. We then have some uh, controller um, code uh, in our class. So this is something uh, that's been added uh, uh, by ECMAScript uh, 6 already. Uh, we can define the class hello world with an input uh, uh, parameter name which we can, uh, which we have used uh, in our view. And finally, we need to tell Angular uh, that this component is the, the main component of our application so that Angular should bootstrap this uh, component uh, to be the main one. And that's basically uh, how a component is written. Some other things uh, that are different uh, to, the, to version 1, for example, is that not everything is available everywhere per se. Uh, we need to import uh, the things we, we are using. So uh, we are we're separating uh, now everything a bit more more strictly. Okay, yeah. Um, when we have this the simple import statement in uh, in TypeScript, and we say TypeScript uh, is not yet interpreted by our browser, so it must be uh, transpiled to uh, to JavaScript or ECMAScript five. Uh, what actually happens is that, that uh, this is translated uh, to some code uh, that loads uh, this module uh, using system uh, JS and, and makes it uh, available uh, then for us. So a very simple statement in, in TypeScript, but when you look at the, the resulting JavaScript code, uh, you will see that there's quite some uh, stuff going on in the background. Uh, the component annotation, we have seen uh, some of the, the things we can specify here, there's a bit more. Uh, we've already had the selector, uh, what we can also do is we can uh, include uh, directives. Uh, 
the directive uh, would be uh, the NGIF. Uh, this is a directive. Uh, why is it not uh, not listed uh, on the on the top? It's because uh, some very basic directives, such as the NGIF, NG4, and, and things like this, are automatically um, included into into every component. Um, we have providers and few providers. Um, when we're using uh, a service uh, or an injectable here, uh, we need to tell Angular where to take it from. So not everything is available everywhere uh, per se. We really uh, strictly need to define uh, what we are using and how Angular uh, can get hold of the things we are, we are using. Then there are pipes. Uh, I will come to this uh, later. Styles or, or style URLs. Um, those are mutually uh, exclusive to, uh, no, uh, those are not, uh, you can combine it. Uh, you can uh, define uh, uh, CSS uh, stylings here and also uh, give the, the URLs to, to style sheets uh, to uh, yeah, enhance your UI. What's mutually exclusive is template and template URL. So the actual uh, view, you can either inline it or you can uh, define it in an own file and uh, load it from there. And the, the third uh, part we had was the, the controller, so the, the class uh, where we are, we are implementing uh, some basic uh, uh, business logic. Uh, we had uh, the simple or the, the short hand version uh, where we define an input uh, parameter name of type st uh, string. We could do the same uh, in the way we do here, that we define a, a field uh, name on the Hello World class and in the constructor uh, set uh, this, this uh, field and also add some uh, extra logic here. And uh, as I've already mentioned, we have the, the bootstrapping, so we need to tell Angular that uh, this is the one component uh, where it should uh, bootstrap the, the application from. Um, when you've been working with Angular 1, uh, you might be wondering why is now the component, the, the basic uh, building block uh, of, an, of an application where it used to be directives. Uh, Directives are a superset of, of components, actually. Uh, a component is a, a directive which has a view uh, also. So that's the, the difference between a di directive as the super uh, set and a component which is a, a special kind of, of directive. Um, here I've put an example uh, of a directive which does not come uh, with a view. Um, it's the it's a directive which does a very basic uh, logging, uh, like every time you, you click, um, you click um, the annotated uh, uh, element, uh, you get some log output. Um, how is this done? We have the directive annotation, we have a selector, so in our HTML uh, code to, to which element should this be applied. Uh, the element it is, it, it is applied to is the host. And here we define that on the click event of the host, uh, the, the parentheses here indicate that it's an event. So on the click event, uh, we are triggering our uh, function on click, uh, which is defined uh, down there in, in our logic. And what we are doing here is that we just log uh, to the console that uh, a click has occurred. And then in the, in the view, we're just uh, adding uh, the click logger, so that the, uh, the selector we, we have defined here, we're adding it uh, to the button and every time we click, we were getting this uh, log output. As I've already mentioned before, there are some very basic uh, directive which uh, uh, come to uh, which Angular automatically adds to, to each component. It's the ng if uh, for basic uh, 
uh, true or false uh, checks, we have the ng4 uh, for loops, where we can, for example, iterate over a list and, and print out uh, each element of the list. We have the ng switch, ng switch when and, and default uh, for uh, as a yeah, extended version of the if where we do this uh, select case uh, thing, and we have ng style and ng class where we can use uh, Angular exp uh, expressions in uh, class uh, de uh, declarations or, or style uh, declarations. Okay, so those have been uh, components as the, the building block and interactives uh, as the similar thing but without the view. Uh, what about uh, data binding? We, we have this block, it, it's encapsulated more or less. How does the data get in and, and get out there? Uh, in Angular 1, everything was, uh, at least in the earlier version, everything was uh, a two way data binding. Uh, which was quite uh, comfortable for small uh, applications, but uh, as soon as applications got larger, uh, it also became uh, a performance issue. Um, an example would be uh, ng uh, of four statements where you loop, uh, where you iterate over a large list, and in each entry of the list, you, you bind several fields uh, to your UI and everything. Uh, had a watch on it that, that reacted on, on any change. So there were a huge number of, of watches which were time consuming, which was uh, a problem uh, in Angular 1. Angular 2 uh, therefore does something different. Uh, you can still have the two-way uh, data binding, uh, but you have to, to do this explicitly. Per default, you have either one of the two, either the binding in uh, up or uh, yeah, in or out uh, direction, I might say. Uh, with the parentheses, uh, you, uh, you can react on an event. Like here, uh, uh, we put the parentheses around the, the click. So on each uh, click event, uh, we're triggering this uh, select item function. On the other hand, we have the, the brackets, uh, like here, we're using it to bind uh, the value of, of this variable to the, the source attribute here. And uh, down there, we, ha we have what we had in Angular 1. We're combining those two to get the two-way data binding. Um, what we also can do is um, to use the double curly braces uh, to also print the value of a, of a variable uh, in the, the text uh, part of an, of an uh, HTML uh, attack. And we have this hash, uh, which is allows us to um, define variables which are private uh, to the view. Uh, we see it down here. Uh, we have the my item uh, variable defined here. Uh, so to this variable, um, the, the input element uh, gets bound um, and we can, it's not used here, but we, we could use it uh, everywhere in the view. So we could uh, use this variable here, for example, that we say the add new item and we hand over the uh, my item in there. So this is uh, the, the third way of, of binding uh, variables here. Another uh, important concept is uh, dependency injection. So I don't want to have all the, the business logic in my controller. I want to have a, a clearer separation into, into layers. Um, I have the, the add injectable uh, annotation, which I can uh, put on a, on a service where I, I want uh, to have my business logic. Uh, and uh, on the on the other side, uh, where it's used, so where it's injected, um, there are two things to consider. Uh, first of all, I need uh, to import it. So I need uh, to tell Angular that uh, uh, where, to, where to get uh, this service from. And in the bootstrapping uh, process, 
I need to uh, define the provider uh, for this. Uh, um, and besides the directive components, uh, the injectables, there's the, the third uh, major uh, concept in, in Angular, it's pipes. Uh, pipes is uh, what was called filters uh, in Angular 1. Uh, um, it's uh, annotated, uh, it's, it's uh, written using the, the pipe symbol. What it basically does is it, it takes the variable, uh, the confluence as we have here, and it applies some, some transformation on, on this data, basically uh, to get a nicer output, uh, or to get a nicer visualization. It can be, uh, be trained uh, as we have in the, in the uh, example down, down there, so we can uh, we can take a date, then, then put the date uh, transformation on it, and then uh, make everything uppercase. And here we have another thing, so that the pipes uh, can even have a parameter. So for the date, I can specify a date format, uh, which is used uh, in the pipe. Uh, and again, Angular comes uh, with some uh, things already built in. Uh, the date pipe, for example, a very uh, powerful thing is the JSON pipe. Uh, we normally use it uh, for debugging uh, when we just uh, print out uh, the values of, of variables uh, in, the, in the UI. Um, you can also write or define your own pipes. Uh, again, there's an annotation for it. You just put the add pipe. Um, upon your class, uh, you give it a name uh, by which it's then called, uh, and you need to implement uh, the, the pipe uh, transform. So it's, every pipe is, is, is a data transform, and therefore you need to implement this uh, transform method. Uh, at the, the other end, where, where you use it, uh, you need to import it, uh, and uh, in the pipes uh, section of a component definition, tell Angular uh, where it comes from, uh, uh, which provider uh, you have for this. Um, there are many more things uh, one could tell about Angular 2. Uh, Angular 2 uh, comes now with um, RxJS um, instead of, of promises um, as we, we uh, it was used in version 1. Uh, version 2 now uh, uses observables uh, for asynchronous data. Uh, we have a very powerful router where we can uh, have hierarchical routes, subroutes, etc. We have form controls where, where web forms uh, can very easily be bound uh, to, to variables or to, to, to your logic entity. The other way around. So those are the, the basic uh, things uh, I wanted to tell about Angular. Uh, the examples I've shown, they're, they're very minimalistic. Uh, so how do we get from those uh, very small examples to, to real uh, world uh, projects? And two things I I want to mention here is that um, in, in our uh, development uh, process, uh, we have uh, continuous integration. And how does the transpiling uh, go or blend in uh, with continuous integration? Uh, this is something uh, that comes quite easily. Um, in our case, we're using Gradle. Uh, for our build scripts, and what you can do uh, to, to integrate um, a, a Angular 2 application to, to this build chain is to uh, just uh, include uh, this plugin. You have then the node task where you can automatically on your build server download a node server. With this node server, you can then run the npm install to get all the, the dependencies you need. The, the dev dependencies as well as the, the actual uh, application dependencies. You can then run a gulp task, and in, in your gulp task, you can do uh, 
the transpiling. Uh, so this is how we have uh, included uh, the, the front end build uh, into, into our projects and into our uh, continuous integration uh, cycle. Another thing is testing. Uh, Yes, uh, I can show you the GARP file if you're interested. Or we, we can do this in the Q&A afterwards. Yeah. Um, testing. Um, for for front-end uh, front applications, as they become more and more complex, testing al uh, also becomes an, an important issue. Um, there are two, two types of testing. There's the, the unit testing. Uh, the default way of, of doing this is using the Jasmine uh, framework and Karma as a, as a test, uh, uh, as a runner. Uh, you have here this, uh, an example of, of how it's done. It's, it is there, it's nothing to worry about. So testing is, is thought about and is, is well um, included in, in Angular uh, 2. The other way, or the other type of testing you can do uh, uh, pure front-end tests, end-to-end -end tests, uh, where you can test your UI. Um, as you might know from, uh, from Selenium, uh, where you uh, go uh, directly, uh, you call a UL, you, you take the, uh, the response, the, the, the entire HTML uh, response, you then are looking for for elements using different uh, selectors, and then you can do your, your checks on, on these elements. Um, and here you, you see by repeater, this is something, for example, that's uh, directly targeted to, to Angular, where we have these ng4 repeaters, which we can test uh, using these methods. So also testing uh, is yeah, well thought of and, and well integrated into into Angular. Why or how does this relate to, to mobile development? Um, one uh, cross-platform uh, mobile development uh, frameworks I want to, to mention here or to, I want to present is NativeScript. Uh, the idea of, of NativeScript is to use JavaScript uh, for mobile development so that you can when you come from the from the web development uh, field, you can reuse your skills uh, in the in the mobile field. Uh, what NativeScript does is um, it's available at the moment uh, for for Android and, and iOS. Um, it uses the, the JavaScript uh, virtual machines um, V8 for Android and, and JavaScript core for iOS, and it uh, using using APIs from from those virtual machines. It uh, builds a layer around this, this virtual machine upon which we can then build our app. Uh, it, uh, it sounds not, not too intuitive, um, but uh, with very easy means, uh, you can in this way uh, develop a, a mobile application which runs on iOS as well as Android. Uh, it comes with some tooling. Basically, all you need to do is uh, to, to install a, a native script, then you can run uh, create and, and platform add. You can do this for Android as well as, as iOS. You can implement uh, some code, and we're just uh, calling uh, TNS run, and then the platform, uh, you can execute the code on an emulator or on an uh, attached uh, device. What you're doing is in some JavaScript code, uh, here you basically define uh, the main view uh, of your mobile application, and in an XML file, you define the front end. So how does this uh, go with Angular? Uh, an important thing about Angular 2 I have not mentioned yet is that Angular 2 does not uh, uh, rely on a DOM anymore. So Angular 2 is not bound uh, to a DOM representation. Instead of, of a DOM, you can uh, feed uh, into your UI uh, renderer other formats as well, such as XML. 
Uh, Native script uh, comes with with its own uh, Angular renderer, uh, which uh, takes care of, of displaying uh, such uh, XML uh, definitions, which can then run on Android as well as on as on iOS. Uh, it's just in time uh, compiled, and uh, yeah, it's a detail. Uh, but what's really uh, amazing is that. When you look at this line, uh, you might recognize that Android text format time, this is Java code. And uh, Android Java code can now be called out of, of JavaScript. Uh, and this is, is one of the, the most uh, powerful things of, of native script, um, that you can call platform specific code from uh, your JavaScript code. How does this work? Uh, uh, again, it's uh, the native script runtime. It it's it sits uh, upon your, your virtual machine, and it creates this Android uh, wrapper uh, or, or proxy object, uh, via which you can then uh, call Java code, which then back uh, for all the layers the uh, the native script runtime, and then the the uh, native platform uh, gets executed. Uh, and to to end the talk, uh, I just want to show you uh, a short uh, example of how uh, such an or the, the code for such an app uh, could look. Uh, what we have here uh, is the the app uh, TypeScript, um, where we we tell the runtime uh, that the main uh, page can be loaded from here, can be found here. And instead of, as we had before, just calling bootstrap uh, for your web uh, application, we now call native script bootstrap and hand over this main page to be the, the main uh, component of this app. When we look at the, the main page, we have some very basic JavaScript code, as, as we had in, in our class is that we, we have looked before, we have uh, some, some fields, we have a constructor and, and some basic function that we define here. And over here, we have the, the UI uh, part, which is, web, uh, which is handed over as the template, exactly as we handed over HTML code uh, before for our web applications. So all the concepts we had from Angular, the, the component uh, definition and the, the controller code in, in, in the class part uh, is, is pure Angular 2, uh, with the only where the only difference between web development and mobile development now becomes that in the, in the template code, we don't hand over HTML code, but we hand over XML uh, UI definition files. Uh, for your, our mobile applications. And uh, to come back to, to your question, I can show you the, uh, the build uh, configurations uh, that we're using. Um, on our, our front end, uh, we have this code uh, I've already had in the slide. Uh, so we are here with this uh, Gradle task basically downloading node in a certain version. Uh, we're then uh, calling npm, inst npm install and install gulp. And with the gulp build, we are executing the, the default task in, in our gulp file. In here, uh, we link this to the build and, and in the build we have the compile TypeScript uh, task. And what this looks like is um, that we are using this uh, Gulp plugin, Gulp TypeScript. Uh, we are also creating source maps for this. We are creating uh, our TypeScript uh, project from the TypeScript uh, compiler here. Uh, and basically uh, then define our, our TypeScript source files. 
um, call the TypeScript compiler and, and write everything uh, to JavaScript files. Uh, this is the this was the, the front end part, and we typically separate front end uh, from back end code. So, so this is in in own uh, in its own project uh, in, in our structure. So in the in the back end uh, project in the war task uh, where we uh, create our deployable file, um, we just say we want to include everything from front end uh, dist. Uh, which is exactly the directory where all the front end code, the, uh, the, the transpiled uh, code, uh, gets uh, stored to. Uh, I've been using both. <laughs> uh, um, it's the, um, integrated into to IntelliJ. Of course, it's comfortable when you see an, an error at once, uh, as soon as you type something wrong, uh, it will speed. <laughs> yeah, well, at the first uh, at the first checkout, you, you need to do more steps anyway. You need to do the, the npm install and so on. So you check it out, you run all the steps, you, you do the, the npm install, you do the gulp build, and, and then you, you can start. Yeah. Yeah, so this has already started the QA uh, part, I, I guess. Uh, so uh, if there are any uh, questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, I've not been working with, with uh, Polymer, but uh, I think one of the, uh, a colleague of mine here, he, he did a, a, a comparison and he said, for him, the basic difference is that Angular considers itself as a framework, whereas Polymer considers itself as a library. Uh, and with a framework and, and a library, it actually could go together. So it's it's not uh, mutually exclusive. I I haven't worked with with Polymer. I'm, I'm sorry, so, so I'm. But I, I guess they, they would go together somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can do. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, this is one way of, of handling this. So the, you, you're referring to this uh, example, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is one way to, to handle this. So you can consider, uh, consider this as defining a, a default implementation. Every component uh, can then um, here in the providers override uh, these default settings. So, uh, yeah, you can use it like for as a as a decorator pattern, where each uh, each component then uh, defines it, its own uh, uh, its own provider. It can even uh, define more than one provider, uh, where the, the rule is that the, the latest one to be defined uh, wins. Uh, it still makes sense to define more than one provider in the same component when it's about subcomponents. Like when, when you're nesting components, um, you still might get the effect uh, that the, the ch child components then have another implementation than the, the main component. Yes. Uh, in here from from uh, TypeScript. 
TypeScript. Ah, sorry, yeah, native script. Uh, this one, yeah. Uh, so if you, to come, if it's orientated on, I didn't get it. Uh, not not on Android. Uh, it's it's plat uh, the the goal is to be platform independent. So the um, uh, the XML uh, definition is independent from the platform, but uh, as soon as you run uh, a platform at Android or platform at iOS, um, in your your directory structure, there are uh, uh, folders created where you can overwrite uh, code uh, platform specific, or where you can define platform specific code. No, uh, by, uh, by native script, no, not Angular. So uh, native script more or less uh, utilizes Angular. Uh, um, it depends on what you have installed on, on your machine. So it it uh, it has a mechanism uh, to find out uh, a suitable uh, language level which is available on your machine, and then uh, uses this uh, uh, this language level uh, to uh, create uh, the app or to yeah, compile or build the app. Oh, it's independent from the device. It's it's independent from the device. Yeah. When, yeah. So yeah. yeah. Well, I guess that that's one thing you you need to uh, to think about every time you you develop something uh, for for mobile devices. How far do you want to get back? So what's the the minimum language level? And this is something you can set, or you can uh, simply configure. Yeah. Per default, it's it's level 17, I think. Okay. Um, well, I have not real experience uh, with comparing performance of, of different implementations. Uh, what I can tell is uh, that in the uh, during the creation of Angular 2, uh, very much uh, emphasis was, was given to performance issues. Uh, so, um, like the, the, the rendering mechanism. Compared to, to version 1, the, like the, the rendering mechanism was uh, completely restructures in, in order to make it more performant, also for, for other parts of, of the of the, the life cycle. So, in my intuition, uh, performance shouldn't be uh, an, an issue, especially since when you build uh, an app with native script, you you then get native code. So, during the sure that there's the reflection and so on, but in the end, you get uh, you get native uh, code, and that's the, the performance uh, you need to compare to. So. It yeah, you 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 use one common uh, language tools at the center, and you get two two native apps out of it. And Windows Phone, they announced it. It should be coming. Let's see if it really will be there. Then you have the, the third one. And of course, you can always go back to to web. 